you. Okay? Smile. Your turn. There's no spinach. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out and joining us today. It's a great way to uh, spend your lunch hour <laughs> talking politics and elections. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are excited about that. But uh, we're going to get into a little bit of uh, discussion about not only the political conventions that uh, just ended, but we're also going to talk more uh, politics and elections in general in the state of Illinois especially. And we have a couple of guests here today. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Sean Crawford. I'm the news director at WUIS. It's the public radio or NPR station here on campus. And uh, before taking on that role, I served as a reporter at the state capitol for about 13 years. Uh, also covered two different political conventions. Uh, the Republican convention in Philadelphia back in the year uh, 2000 and the Democratic Convention in Boston in 2004. And our panel uh, both covered each of the party's conventions this year. Now I do want to mention as well if you have any questions or comments you want to uh, uh, talk to us in any way just feel free whenever the mood hits you to come on up to the microphone over there to my left and uh, we'd like to hear what you had to say. Uh, first of all, let me introduce Amanda Vinicky, seated next to me. She's the State House Bureau Chief for WUIS. She earned an MA in Public Affairs Reporting from UIS back in 2005. She completed undergraduate degrees in Broadcast Journalism and Political Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2003. And Amanda has been covering the Illinois General Assembly for WUIS and the statewide Illinois Public Radio Network since 2006. She's won several awards during that time. And Dave McKinney, on my far left, he's been the Springfield Bureau Chief for the Chicago Sun-Times since 1995. Before that, he was a government and general assignment reporter at the Daily Herald in Arlington Heights, where he began his career after graduating from Eastern Illinois University with a journalism degree in 1986. He's also won numerous awards for his political coverage. I'm going to throw the first question out and just let these guys talk a bit about the political conventions. The uh, Republicans met in Tampa, Florida. The Democrats met in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'll start with Amanda and give us some general overview of, of what you saw there. So um, basically how the conventions work, we're there to cover, you have more of the <clears throat> Illinois delegation. So obviously following what's happening on a national perspective. but. We have national public radio to do that. So my main concern at the conventions wasn't to follow every utterance of Mitt Romney. It was more to follow the Illinois leaders and their reaction to Mitt Romney and what they're going to do come November, both in the presidential race, but also Illinois has a handful, six actually, congressional races that are really tight. So those that was a big focus at the GOP convention for Illinoisans. And you saw a lot of posturing for an election that is a couple years off, but nonetheless an important one, the gubernatorial election in Illinois. And so a lot of posturing by prominent state Republicans who are interested in running against perhaps Pat Quinn or whomever the Democrat may be. So I think those were sort of the themes. Kind of how it works is a reporter is every morning um, the Illinois delegation, so the elected delegates as well as alternates, their guests, whoever else wants to come by, so a handful, of, uh, not a handful, a bunch really of lobbyists, lobbyists who in part sponsor the events, uh, will hold a breakfast. And that's kind of their daily meeting. They all gather, they rally, they cheer, they're gung-ho, you bring in uh, other uh, prominent Republicans, sometimes some of the delegations where they are maybe more the swing states than Illinois. Illinois is considered fairly blue, so again, outside of those six congressional elections, there's, and we can perhaps talk about this, there's a lot of thought that Illinois is pretty assuredly going to go for Obama, and therefore a lot of the national Republicans don't give our state a ton of attention because they don't need to in a way they think they see it as somewhat a lost cause. So some of the delegations will get movie stars and such. Illinois, uh, we got what? Um, John Boehner was probably the most prominent big name. So the Speaker of the U.S. House is, who's trying to hold on to it and again concerned about Illinois because 
our state could play a major role in whether or not he keeps that role or whether he has to head the minority party in Congress. Uh, so they have these rallying cries, bring in speakers, kind of get the business done for the day, and then you'll see the delegates go off. Sometimes it's free time where they're not a potential hurricane or tropical storm that hit Tampa when we were there. I think we would have seen a lot more pool lounging going on in the afternoon than actually did occur, um, but instead, People just kind of, you know, spend their days talking to one another, meeting up, and then it's the evening. That's what you see on TV is the big coverage where, you know, the vice presidential candidate, where you heard from Paul Ryan, where you heard from Romney. And so we're there to cover that as well and just get Illinois delegates' reaction. So there's kind of the, the state angle. Dave? Yeah, I mean, for, for both of us, I think the whole thing, the whole exercise started out with this, this uh, uh, question, will there be 15 to 20 inches of rain falling on us? And so one of the first things I did was to go to Dick's Sporting Goods and buy this really cool rain gear and really cool rain pants. And, you know, it never got out of my suitcase because it, it just passed over Tampa. We've had worse storms kind of, here. Yeah, sure. it, was, it, was, it was very weak, you know, big buildup, but, but not much there. I mean, Amanda hit it on the point, uh, all the points here. I mean, you know, the, in, in both of these conventions, it was... Um, you know, the start of the day was very hectic covering these breakfasts that the Illinois Republicans and Democrats both held. You know, it, 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 felt, it felt to me like the Republicans, this go around, um, th there was a definite enthusiasm level there that I felt that might have been missing in previous years. I mean, these guys really think that, you know, in spite of having a terrible map drawn for them, you know, at least on a congressional basis, they, they really, I think, feel optimistic going into the 2014 gubernatorial election. I mean, I, I think I came away from the Republican convention you know, really convinced that there are five or six, you know, really viable candidates that, that could emerge. And, you know, the guy that I, I wound up spending the most time with there probably was Aaron Schock. I didn't know him well when he was in the legislature representing Peoria. But, but you know, he's a guy who's very driven. And uh, it, it was interesting spending about an hour with him and, and you know, definitely getting the vibe that he's, he's thinking about running for governor or possibly uh, U.S. Senate if Dick Durbin retires in uh, 2014. You know, on the Democratic side, um, you know, we saw, um, you know, I think the, the issue there was like, especially at the presidential level, is, is, uh, is there an enthusiasm deficit? Because, you know, the, the base, um, you know, while, while they are there for Barack Obama, it's, it's, you know, most people are still feeling the effects of the economy. The, the, you know, there's not great, great enthusiasm here. And, and so, you know, in, in, uh, in Charlotte, you know, we saw this question about whether they were going to do, uh, do the event out in a football stadium that could hold 80,000 people. And they pulled the plug on that, and, you know, they said it was the weather that was the problem, but, you know, it seemed like all the storm clouds had kind of drifted away a day or two earlier, you know. So, I mean, there was that question in Charlotte whether they were basically kind of putting all of their people into a, a tighter arena to make it look like it was, it was fired up. And I will say, you know, uh, you know, inside that arena in Charlotte, you know, the Democrats were pumped. And, and uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, I'd never seen him deliver a speech before, but he is, he is a master. I mean, he, he comes across as a Baptist minister. I mean, he just, he relates to people on a, on a real gut level. Uh, and, and I think he, he scored great points. His speech, frankly, in my mind, was way better than Obama's. And, and uh, I thought Michelle Obama was amazing, you know. And, and it was true on the Republican side, too. I thought uh, Ann Romney was, was a, a really strong speaker at night. And I thought Paul Ryan did a good job. You know, I mean, he was, he was so youthful. And uh, in that Ryan speech, the one thing that I came away with, um, you know, a day or so later wondering about, I mean, he, he d delivered such a great technical speech. I mean, uh, but, but he had that, that line in there about the Janesville auto plant. And it, it was, you know, I, I don't know if he was trying to get greedy and, and going after Obama a little bit too hard, but, but he, he was blaming Obama for this plant closure, this auto plant closure in uh, Wisconsin. And Obama wasn't president then. And it was just... A tiny little detail like that clouded what I thought otherwise was a great speech by by Ryan, and uh, again on the on the Republican side, Romney I thought came across kind of flat. So really on both sides we had the, the presidential candidates I think playing real conservative, and uh, you know so but it was just it was real interesting seeing. Uh, you know, seeing how it all plays out, you feel like you're in the center of the universe, really. I think that's the thing. I think it both. People always ask, so which was more fun or which was more interesting? And being able to cover both, I did um, this year as well as four years ago. When you're there, the energy is immense. It is in entirely just overflowing. It is loud. There is music. Uh, I would say maybe... 
I will give a bit to the Republicans just because, as Dave had said, the Democrats at the last minute moved what was supposed to have been an outdoor last night Obama speech inside so they didn't have as many balloons and confetti set up. There was you know, just a smidgen of that. And let me tell you, yes, when there are balloons and confetti falling on you, when you have a bunch of adults that basically look like they're in that ball pit at Showbiz Pizza, and there is music playing, and they have just heard, I mean, these are the party faithful. That's who you have at the conventions. It's not like you have the moderates or the undecideds. You have people who want to be there and to them, Obama and Romney are rock stars, as are everybody else there. You know, getting autographs from other politicians that walk by. I saw um, Illinois had pretty good seats, actually, at both conventions, fairly near the stage. And so that was kind of exciting for the, delega for the delegates. But then uh, at the RNC, Illinois was pretty close to New Jersey. And at one point, uh, Chris Christie was there, and he was just kind of standing on the side aisle. And you know, where else do you see people taking pictures? And I mean, like it was that you know fast flash setting or whatever it is, where it's just go ch -ch 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 -ch. and everybody. It was like rapid gun machine fire trying to take pictures of this guy. Um, and so that's something to to keep in mind that at these events, it's. It is a lot of energy. That's what they're to do. They're to do. They're to, they're to pump up the base, and then hopefully that will come and get the word out when they get back home and have the party faithful go knocking on doors and get votes to the people who aren't there at the conventions. I mean, it was kind of surreal the, the celebrity watching that you could do if, if you really had the time and, and energy and focus. But like at the Republican uh, convention, I know we were walking outside the uh, the press filing center and came up came upon a security checkpoint at one point. And there's this guy uh, with, with really bright yellow hair, uh, colored obviously, and uh, a white suit, white shoes, and it was Pat Boone. You know, for most of you young people here, you may not know who Pat Boone is, but he was a crooner from the 1950s. And, and he's taken up, he's, he's a real, um, I'd say a real strong family values, conservative um, icon really. And he's, he's been working a lot of congressional races in the South. And so, you know, he shows up out of nowhere. At the Democratic convention, I mean, I, I'm also at a security checkpoint, and like these four guys walk by, and it's the Foo Fighters, you know, and it's like they're, they're 10 feet away. So, I mean, th these places just draw all kinds of celebrities. I mean, there are tons of them that show up at parties. I mean, every single night, you know, there's, there are these parties that uh, just go on you know, late into Jessica tonight. Alba went to Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel's big party, so I know for a lot of my um, friends, my Democratic friends, they were very excited to have met Jessica Alba, who evidently is this hot in <laughs> real life. Um, I met John Oliver at the airport. That was cool, yeah. just because I think he's really funny. Well, yeah, we, we, were, we, we shared the <laughs> same cool. plane to, uh, was it, was it uh, Charlotte? Mm -hmm. and we were sitting next to a producer on The Daily Show, you know? So, I mean, it, it just, you know, it, it's just... You know, when you have 40 or 50,000 journalists all converging onto one place like that, and then the celebrities are coming, and then the politicians are there, it's just a spectacle, you know, both places. How many people uh, watch any of the conventions, political conventions on TV? Or how, how, how many of you watched, like, all four nights of each convention? Like, not that many, right? So I don't blame you. I mean, it can get a little tiring to watch. These are, these are political pageants. The outcome is decided long before these things ever start. So that brings up another question, and one that is being discussed a lot in a time where media is finding a lot less money and a lot less ability to send people places is, is this worth the time and effort to be there as a, as a reporter? And get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, I, I don't know how much this would <clears throat> change the final outcome of an election. I think probably the most memorable thing for anybody coming out of these would be Clint Eastwood and his invisible chair and how often we're going to see spoofs of that on Saturday Night Live for the next seven months, you know? Uh, it, that I think is really probably for most people what what they know about. That said, I think that, it, again, what's important for the politicians is rallying that base. It's not, it, it, yes, it's of course the final night and how many people you can get to watch and draw it in uh, that last night to see a president speak or to see the want to be president speak and get to know Mitt Romney. It's his big chance when everybody's eyes are watching. So I think there is that, but it's also rallying the base so that they can get out there. It's instilling them with the confidence, with the possibility, yes, we can do this, we will make it happen. It, it's that component. Um, and in terms of the media, I, I do think that you have the 
again, to get back to Clint Eastwood, the it, for is scripted as these events are, there are the what ifs. What if somebody makes a mistake? What if when you have every the, the media all kind of watching each other and listening and all eyes on politics, what's somebody going to say during an interview? Fine, maybe it's not on stage during the speech, but what are, will happen before that that will catch a lot of people's attention? Um, and I think for the media, at least for us, uh, yes, there is, I had spoke to in the very beginning, I think that there's a difference between what nationally is being covered and then what we were there to do. And I think that there, for me, and obviously this is coming off the heels of covering it and having loved that experience, but there's so much that goes on with the state's most prominent leaders. And that's something to bear in mind. So I think there is a different case to be made for what happens on a national storyline versus the local or state perspective. I mean, to answer your question, I think it's definitely worth covering because um, you, know, you, you, you get this time, like I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah. with Aaron Schock, for example. I mean, a, a ten, you know, probably an hour of time just kind of talking about his life story, about, about uh, you know, kind of his views on government. And it was like you get that moment with, with pretty much all these people. And, and it's, it's really, uh, I, I know I come out of it really feeling like I've got a great grip on not only the gubernatorial race as it stands now, but also the congressional races that are up in the Chicago area that are, you know, going to be key to whether Republicans hold on to the uh, House or they, or they don't. You know, just to give you an idea of the expense, though, I mean, there, there's a legitimate question. Most media organizations now are, you know, been laying people off, contracting, and, it's, and it just continues. And, and uh, you know, when you, you can't afford to hire a city hall reporter, then, then, yeah, you have to scratch your head and wonder, is this worth covering? For, for example, uh, to get workspace, which consists of a table just like this, with, with a plug-in and with an internet, hardwire internet signal, and I think a phone line, it, it, for, the, for the both, uh, both conventions, it cost $7,000. And you can imagine a paper the size of the Sun-Times, that was even too much for us. So what we did was just basically, we, we were kind of troopers, and, and you know, you find a hot spot and you write from there. And uh, you know, one of our favorite places was a place called the CNN Grill. You know, the CNN is, is a marketing shtick. Basically, uh, they rent a, a bar or a restaurant for a week near the convention site. Parking garage, I believe. Yeah, it was a parking <laughs> was garage in, uh, in Tampa. But they, they, they basically, you know, free food, free beer, or whatever, and you've got these screens. And then, you know, all these people come in afterwards. Newt Gingrich, we, we were sitting right behind Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum. And, you know, it, it was just fascinating to watch that. But, but the expense is amazing. I mean, I was staying. In Charlotte, I stayed at a Hampton Inn, right? That's a budget, budget motel, right? My nightly cost for that was $3.99 a night, you know? And it, it gives you an idea that the prices for the hotels, for every place, they're jacked way up for these events. And so that puts a further strain on, on news organizations that are trying to cover this. I, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say, there are, I think, that's part of, of course, the changing media and what have you. Being able to do it on the fly is an advantage. So I know we never have had workspace for good old public radio. I mean, NPR, I think, does. <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure, in fact. But you, you are able to do it on the fly. The hardest part is just finding a Wi-Fi spot that's not so crowded out that you can actually send your material out. But once you get that, you're golden. So it's, again, as Dave had hinted at, spending a lot of time finding a good coffee shop that you can kind of hide away in for a couple of hours and write and type and send it out. But you are able to do it on the fly and from your phone, sending audio if need be, editing audio in my case, or you know, updating Twitter. You can all do it without that if you, if you need to. And I would add that another benefit, and I think what Dave was also um, getting at, but just to kind of hone in on it, how coming away as a reporter, having a feel for things is really important. It's getting to know people, but also watching these people interact with one another. So I know after having covered Illinois politics and been at the state house for too many years than I care to count right now, but um, after that, I, I know basically the players. What you don't get to see is the players on a 24-5 basis to the point that you can see, all right, so who's talking to who? Who's hanging out, again, poolside? Or who's sitting together at breakfast? And who is, what, what lobbyists are networking with what gubernatorial wannabe? And I think those are all very key things that Springfield as a capital town, you kind of see some of that because there are a limited number of restaurants. The you know capital is right downtown, so you see some of that more than you would in 
capitals that are based in bigger cities. But it's an entirely different thing when you're, you know, staying in the same hotel is we were at the RNC as all of the delegates and as all of the politicians and kind of watching it on that level and seeing them, these things last late. It goes until 1130 or midnight and you've got an hour to get, it was an hour bus trip in Tampa from where the convention was held back to the hotel, but people would sit and talk and hang out at the bar until 2 a.m. And watching that and hearing what they're talking about is really a key insights for a journalist. I think but, it was but don't you think that kind of sounds, I mean, it sounds almost like People Magazine style reporting <laughs> to some extent, like who, what movie star did we see, who was sitting by who? I mean, you can see where people make the argument that these things just aren't worth it. Well, I, well, I guess it depends what you walk away with. And, and you know, like, like I think we both sort of walked away with that, that sense that it's going to be a very competitive Republican field, a very Republican competitive field for governor. Uh, these people are all energized. They think that they have a legitimate chance to knock Quinn out. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there's there's something to be said about that. And it, it, you know, the body, the body English of these people, it, it you just you develop a texture. It develops a texture in who they are. I mean, for example, on the Republican side, you know, there are, I think, in the Chicago area, four congressional incumbents, Republicans, who were elected in the last cycle, and then they they got basically mapped out of, you know, these comfortable districts into Democratic districts. And, and I know that uh, at least some of them, rather than be there for the entire time in Tampa, beachside, beautiful Gulf of Mexico, they chose to be there just, they parachute in for one day and out. And the reason for that is that they know lurking somewhere in the bushes is probably an opposition research, you know, person for the other party ready to snap a picture of them lounging on a beach while people in their district are suffering, you know, economically. That's the stuff that would be the, you know, made for a mailer. But it's, it, you know, nowhere else at no other time do you have all these people in one place that you can just kind it's of It's like a wedding. Yeah. You know when you go to a wedding and it's everybody that is central to the bride and groom's wife, friends from high school, from college, family, and you know, you see them all get together. That's, I guess, in a way what conventions are. It's everybody who's anybody in these parties and you see who gets along with who? And I think there were some very telling moments at the Republican National Convention where you could kind of see some sniping between um, the party chairman and a, a, um, a certain politician who is a rising star. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you can see that. <laughs> there yeah. was a joke where um, at one point, so the Illinois GOP chairman, Pat Brady, um, was up on the stage, and I forget what kind, and he took a sip, and that there were had heard of bad blood between he and Treasurer Dan Rutherford. Rutherford goes, what, was that water or vodka? I mean, stuff that you wouldn't normally hear them say. <laughs> well, and then, and then on, the, on the, night of, uh, the, the night of Romney's speech, there was, there was another interesting interaction between the two of them, and, and, you know, one wonders afterwards what was said or wasn't said, but but, you know, Romney is walking toward the stage through, you know, shaking everybody's hands, doing the, the, the victory lap ahead of time, and he gets to the Illinois delegation, and the, the state GOP chairman, Pat Brady, is there, sticks his hand out, shakes his hand, and somehow Brady had kind of outmaneuvered, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong phrase, but that sounds like it's an active effort, but he was positioned in a way where he had that opportunity to shake the nominee's hand. Rutherford, the chairman of the Romney campaign, was kind of iced out of that, and I know there was a little bit of like kind of behind the scenes, like, oh, did you see that, you know? And so that little stuff like that, that's entertaining. And, you know, you see these More than practices. entertaining. I mean, it's yeah. telling, right. I think. It's, it's both. You know, and, and Brady himself, he, he's not well known to the masses, but he's the, he's the state GOP chairman. And he's, he's actually a really funny guy. I mean, he's got a sense of humor here. He's, I don't know if all of you have seen the uh, Fire Madigan uh, kind of shtick that they have, that the Republicans have going on. At the state fair, we saw... You know, all these guys hanging, you know, signs, Fire Madigan, and they were, they opened up a website while we were down there where you could get, like, dog t-shirts that say Fire Madigan, and, you know, that, that I think that's a brainchild of, of Pat Brady, but he also made a, a joke about, you know, in Florida, with the, the mayor of Clearwater standing nearby about Catherine Harris, from, I don't know if those of you who remember Catherine Harris, she's the former Florida Secretary of State who played a very pivotal role in the 2000 election that, that got George Bush the presidency, and, and, uh, he just he made a crack about her vote counting methods and how how they're not unlike Cook County, you know. And and everybody was like, oh, did he really say that, you know? But and he's like, have a sense of humor, yeah, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, he mentioned uh, Mike Madigan, um, and I should mention this uh, briefly. I mean, 
for people that don't know exactly who he is or how politics works in this state, he might be about as close to being sort of a king of politics in the state of Illinois. He not only controls the Illinois House and rules it with a pretty much an iron fist, but he's also the state Democratic Party chairman. So he controls a lot of people who are not in the Illinois House. And uh, I know that Speaker Madigan was a little more, and this is a guy that doesn't talk to the press hardly ever, very rare occasions, but I know he talked with you. I know he was a little more open out at the, uh, at the convention, but uh, that, I guess, could be argued as another reason to go as you get these people maybe with their guard down a little bit, more willing to discuss certain topics. Oh, clearly, and I think, you know, what I've seen over time with Madigan is he'll, he'll tend to open up, you know, before election cycles where, you know, things might be a little tighter in certain places, you know, and I think, you know, their polling shows that they have a very weak governor poll-wise now, and so, you know, does that trickle down to the House races? And that's always been Mike Madigan's number one priority, you know, retaining control of the House. But I, I will tell you, I mean, I, I went down, it was the night that Clinton was speaking, I, I went down onto the floor of the convention, and, and Madigan was sitting there, and I, I just sat down on the chair next to him, and we, we started talking. And, and the way the man's brain works is just fascinating, because he, he, he gave this history lesson about, you know, I asked him, was this your, you know, what, when was your first convention? And you'd think a guy who, who came to the Illinois House in 1971 would have gone to many of them. But he, he said his first one was in Boston, which, you know, is fairly recent. Mm -hmm. Uh, he said that in 1972, he was going to go to the uh, convention in, I believe it was in Miami that year, but uh, at that point, um, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and a Chicago lawyer named Bill Singer, both were McGovern people, and they didn't like the fact that, that uh, Madigan was coming out of a machine, you know, Mayor Daley thing, so they, they did some maneuvering to keep him out as a delegate, so he didn't get to go, and I think it must have left a sour taste in his mouth, but, you know, to hear him talking in such detail about about that experience that happened, you know, nearly more than 40 years ago, was fascinating to me because at that point in time, I think I was in kindergarten, you know. <laughs> and you guys were glimmers. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think that to touch on something, the fire Madigan, first of all, to uh, go back to the strategy by the Republicans, it's an interesting one because he is such the figure in Illinois politics. He is the longest-serving. House Speaker, not just in Illinois, but nationally. And he's been around for everything. And he's not only House uh, Speaker, he's also Chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois. So it's really an interesting nexus, one that I think isn't duplicated really anywhere else. It's, it, he's carved out a niche for himself, and it, and it is just telling to see um, how much energy he puts into Democrats. So we've been talking about Pat Brady, the chairman of the Republican Party, and Madigan isn't quite like that. He is not, he said that yes, he does some of that. He wants to bring Democrats together, but he's really there for his House members. And so watching him in that role, pretty much convention time is the rare opportunity that you're going to see him acting as the chairman of the party. I think, as Dave said, there were a lot of moments just watching Madigan with his family. His wife wasn't there, but the rest of his family, so Attorney General Lisa Madigan, but as well as his other two daughters and his son, kind of watching the family dynamic, again, is a, in, a interesting insight for a reporter to have with her, talking to him about um, just kind of in the hotel, again, watching him mill about, watching who he is going to lunch with and talking to and therefore tied in with. I had the opportunity to speak with him for an hour. We sat down for a sit-down interview where that never really happens during session. He's a busy, busy guy, and this was kind of an opportunity that you wouldn't normally get out in his here, you can only get it when you are removed from the situation. Um, but again, getting back to the Republican uh, campaign of Fire Madigan, it's interesting just because they are really trying to make the case that if you are electing a Democrat to the Illinois House, you are empowering Speaker Madigan, that he has been around so long. He is the one to blame for the state's financial situation. He is the one common denominator. And so they're trying to use that as a campaign tactic. It'll be interesting to see if that works in any way. That Yes, they have this Cafe Press website where you can you know, buy baby bibs and dog shirts and beach towels and whatever you want that says Fire Madigan, but how much is that really going to catch hold in these tight races? How much do people see it as 
Madigan being the issue versus their local candidate, they say polls show it's actually working, that he has been around long enough and Madigan has caught on as a name enough that they think it will be a winning strategy that could put them over the top. I will say the last person that tried to really take on Mike Madigan was Rod Blagojevich. We know how that story ended, so uh, we'll see. Now, I think to, to jump into something else, um, we'll move away from the conventions. And again, if anybody has any questions or comments or anything, if you want to just come to the microphone, we'd be glad to listen to you uh, and talk with you. But the, uh, it, the you mentioned the uh, fact that Madigan, whether or not this would be successful, especially in House races, things like that. Uh, you may or may not be aware, but this year, Illinois uh, lawmakers, all of them at the, the legislative, at the Capitol, all of the seats are up for election. It's a redistricting year, they call it, meaning that there is a new political map that has designed all of the districts in the state. And uh, a lot of changes have taken place. Some lawmakers decide, I don't want to run in this new district. Nobody knows me. I'm going to get the heck out. Uh, but Democrats, because of their majorities at the Capitol and, uh, and uh, controlling the governor's office, they also control this process. So they have drawn all of the maps uh, to benefit, in most cases, the Democratic Party. Even where it benefits a Republican, it's done so usually in a way to say, let's put all the Republican votes in this one district. They won't hurt us as much over here and over here and over here. Um, so again, I mean, in some respects, when we go into an election year like this and one party has had such control over that process, how much enthusiasm among Republicans is out there? Well, I mean, you know, you talk to the Republicans, they, they seem to think that they, they can, you know, they point to the last cycle where they picked up ground in the House. And they think that if they can hold their ground this time, that in 2014 it could be, you know, a, a landmark year for them. I think because you know they really think that that if things if, if the financial condition of the state doesn't improve by then if the economy doesn't improve they think you know there's going to be a landslide potentially of, of support for, for for their candidates so you know I don't know I think uh, I think it's almost surprising I think that when the maps were drawn I mean that's war that can decide a race for the next decade basically what party is going to win it that said I think that is especially in downstate Illinois. You're seeing um, in the congressional races, it looks as if the Republicans have the advantage in pretty much every one. Not that that can't be turned around, not that a candidate can't flub up to the point that everything flips on its face, but if you're looking at it right now, the GOP, despite having those districts drawn so that they are going to be in Democratic, or at least giving Democrats kind of a little bit of favor, that doesn't appear to be working. In the suburbs, it seems to be so more. Uh, when you look at the state races, I think it's a little harder to say just because there are so many more of them, although tellingly there aren't that many considering that every seat in the General Assembly is up. Uh, there are what, uh, I, I don't know, I think a couple dozen maybe that are actually competitive because there are so many districts, as Sean was saying, that are drawn to benefit one party or the other that you don't have, and incumbents have an advantage and they're just entrenched, that there aren't that many competitive races. But I think that, um, I, I from in talking to a lot of my Republican uh, friends and sources who are kind of working these campaigns, they're surprised by how much of a chance they think they have in a lot of these. I guarantee you that both parties are working very hard and staffers are out on campaign and not having a weekend for months and months and months so that they're not spending knocking on doors and doing what they can. So well, let's some talk. of these districts, though, I mean, the, you know, I, I, there's one on the south side that I think it, it really interesting, Jesse Jackson's district. And then uh, in the House and Senate, Senator Don Trotter, and then the former uh, Rep. Connie Howard. I mean, these these are districts, and and because of the the way that, that the city lost people, they they had to draw, they had to take in bigger swaths of suburbia with these city districts so the the city delegation could survive. And so what we see, like in the South Side, are these these really odd districts where they they take in part of you know a real inner city. Uh, south side area, you know, and then they extend down into Will County all the way down to like Mantino, I think, you know, so you're taking in farmland. And it's like, it's such a, such a kind of a strange group. I mean, it's like you don't have, I mean, there's so, it's just so diverse, you know, and uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that realistically in a district like that, Republicans are going to stand much of a chance because they, again, this one, like many of them, is drawn in a way where the, the, the bulk of the, the votes still are, are rooted on the south side. But that just gives a feel like suburbia has been carved up in a, in a different way this election to account for the, 
drop in population in the city. And you see in areas where uh, Democrats had made strides, so sub the suburbs were supposed to, and long were, Republican strongholds, and you saw that change. So, for example, Senator Dan Kotowski is a Democrat who was able to win. He's from Park Ridge, but there's a real chance that he might not hold on to his seat. Uh, when you go down, at Peoria right now is represented by State Senator Dave Kaler. There's a real fight for that race. And it's interesting, I think, especially when you see incumbents, because you, you hear about the incumbent advantage and their name is in the paper. They can brag about what bills they've passed and what they've done. But at what point, not just in Illinois, but of course nationally, is it more a detriment to have a record given that people are hurting? The economy is still fine. We're not in a recession, but it still stinks. Yeah. And it's, especially in Illinois, there are all of these problems here with unions and Democrats uh, and y that big fight with the state budget, um, cuts to education, rising college tuition, the pension mess overriding everything. So at what point does do Democrats not want to brag about, yeah, I've been there for that? Yeah, and here locally, a couple of legislative uh, districts, one was basically created out of the east side of Springfield stretching into really downtown Decatur, goes all the way over there. And it was drawn to benefit a Democrat. Uh, it's an, considered an open seat. There's no incumbent running there. And then also you have a state Senate district, which at one period of time was really mostly Springfield, Springfield proper, and a few towns around it. Larry Bomke, the incumbent senator there, but he's not running again for re-election because the district now stretches virtually all the way to the Mississippi River. So they've diluted some of that. Part of it is downstate losing population. That's also part of this. So it takes in to get a number of people within a district, uh, they have to make the area larger. So that's, that's part of that. Um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the the difference too between the upstate and downstate, when you when you cover politics at the state capitol, you really divide the state almost into three areas, and that is Chicago, the suburban areas, and downstate. When I first started covering politics up there, it was Chicago was Democratic territory, and it still is. Uh, suburb, suburbs were more uh, Republican stronghold, and downstate was mixed, I mean, quite a bit. Now what we're seeing is downstate, though, has really gone much more conservative, even Democrats downstate. Uh, are not necessarily what you would consider a Democrat from upstate. They may favor uh, gun owners' rights. They may be, uh, you know, pro-life. There's a lot of issues like that, that that they just disagree on with with maybe the main uh, agenda of their party. Um, but but things have changed quite a bit. What what has that meant for pol or politics in general in, in the state of Illinois? This this shift we're seeing. Well, I, I don't know. It is fascinating to watch where, like, you know, we see. Uh, you know, in the Senate, for example, polling that, that, you know, in each of these Senate districts, you know, the governor is underwater in, in most of the districts, and you're seeing Democrats like Senator Forby in, in far southern Illinois, you know, openly um, campaigning against Pat Quinn, you know, and so you're seeing that kind of stuff going on, and I think, you know, in terms of the, 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 the political He's not just really campaigning against him. I think he's called him a liar. It's been very, it's, it's, it's been, been, it's, it's been very unusual. Yeah. For, and for, part of that is to do with a lot of decisions that have been made too by Governor Quinn to close facilities. Sure. He's not popular in that district. Absolutely. But, go ahead. but you know, yeah, I mean, I think you, you, uh, you know, the power base is still Chicago, I think, and, and certainly the suburbs. And, you know, for Madigan and, and the Democrats, they, they see suburbia, I think, as the, as the swing. Uh, the swing, it's the swing region. state of the Absolutely. state. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's a good way to put it. Because, I mean, I remember, like, Sean, you know, in the late 90s, that's when, that's when the Democrats started making inroads in uh, picking off Republican seats in the suburbs. And ever since, they've held on to them, and they've, they've, they've built upon that. And, you know, that's going to be a key thing to watch in this election cycle and certainly the next one. If we see any, any Republican inroads in suburbia, then, you know, that's the time when Republicans, you know, might seriously be talking about taking back control of the House or the Senate. I think that brings up several points, though. You see issues within the Republican Party with that. Part of why you know some uh, pontificators say Republicans were losing out is because they made it about social issues instead of fiscal ones. And now that the economy is the issue, is that where Republicans will be able to pick up more in the suburbs, where voters tend to be more moderate. There's the, the fight between, there's long been a fight between the conservative element of the Republican Party and the more moderate um, 
part of the Republican Party, and that is amplified with the Tea Party now and coming in, uh, which hasn't had that strong a presence in Illinois, but uh, a presence nonetheless. And I think the national name and the what's going on nationally with Republicans, people don't necessarily segregate their GOPs into where they're coming from. So I think that's an issue. And you're going to see that play out in the state Senate some. I think uh, whether how well say Republicans do is going to show if Christine Rodonio is able to hold on as leader. She is fairly moderate, or at least is known as such. And will there be kind of a fight from the more conservative elements of the party to you know, take over there? I think that that's something. I also think uh, when you talk about downstate and it's coming away from the Democratic Party, that's been a clear decision. You're watching uh, in this pension fight, Speaker Madigan say, we want to schools to chip in. Right now, Chicago is the only school system where Illinois isn't paying for their teachers' retirement. And that's easy for him to say because there's one Republican who is from Chicago. <laughs> um, and, and so it's been a strategic decision because Democrats have that base all tied up. You're watching but, but Pat it's, Quinn. It's risky, though, because I think with the, with the suburbs, with the suburbs because they're I mean, such Madigan, a swing. Madigan's mm -hmm. got to you know, maintain control there. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why I think we've seen such a delay in getting any kind of, of stuff done control. on pension reform. I mean, now we're talking about doing it in January after the election cycle. So that buys you know, the Democrats another go around uh, mm -hmm. you know, with, with that election. So. And I'll add real quick, because I know you have, you have a question, but I, I think that what you're seeing from Governor Pat Quinn, and again, getting to this kind of downstate, and he's polling badly there, and that he has made this decision to close facilities, close prisons, kind of close these facilities, even in Jacksonville, um, that are the developmental center there, that are... Jacksonville has a college, but that are otherwise the pulse of the community, the big employer, and going to be huge for what happens in the future of these communities. Uh, Quinn is doing that. Republicans say, oh, it's to get back at us. I think more than anything, it is Quinn's, we, we really see him down here at the Capitol. Yes, he's here when there's session, but despite his promises that he was going to live in the mansion and keep his underwear here, I'm sure he has some, but <laughs> I, it, he doesn't stay here. He's in Chicago all the time, and that is because that is where the population is, that's where the voters are, that's where TV is, that's where, other than Dave, and other than Ray Long of the Chicago Tribune, that's where the two big papers in the state are. And so that's a very calculated political decision on the part of the governor who is, has not said he's going to run, but he sure has not denied it, looking forward to 2014 and, and kind of writing off downstate. Should point out Pat Quinn, uh, he won what, three counties mm -hmm. when he won governor? Yeah. That is the difference that Cook County makes in the overall uh, realm of, of politics in the state of Illinois. He won Cook County, and that's what helped propel him into the victory. We do have a question. Yeah. Okay, I actually have two questions. Uh, they're kind of left over from the convention discussion. First of all, um, I'm not really, one's kind of process is, I don't know how the Illinois delegates are selected and how many go, and like the group you're talking about that you hung out with, you know, how many people were in that. And then the second kind of question is, do you think that maybe the, um, the optimism gap or the, you know, people aren't excited really is because the, uh, we've been in election mode since like last year <laughs> and that maybe since people are, are getting kind of bored rather than before when we had primaries later, you know, you know it's a little bit different climate. Well, I mean, the, the, the delegate selection, you know, each, each major presidential candidate, you know, each viable one files a slate of candidates by congressional district in the state. And what we saw in this cycle, there were, there were a number of them who didn't, have their acts together in Illinois to even file full slates. I, I believe like uh, Gingrich was one of them. I think Santorum was another. And so, you know, the Romney people, that they, they had the, the organizational support. And the money. And the money. So they had a full slate of people. You know, their delegates were out in force. You know, we did see a few Ron Paul delegates, although not, I don't know, if, I don't recall running into any Illinois ones, but they were, there were some from uh, Oregon that were hanging out at our hotel, I think. Yeah, I think there were a dozen. At the, so at the Democratic convention, they were all Obama because there really was no primary. Um, but for the Republicans, there were, I believe, a dozen individuals who had been elected as Rick Santorum delegates from Illinois. But when Santorum dropped from the race, he it's called releasing his delegates, basically, you know, 
for party unity, go ahead. And so Illinois unanimously went for Romney. And the delegates, um, the par parties do it differently. It's done, as Dave said, by congressional district. And the parties have different processes. And there's a whole bunch of rules that um, are too arcane to really get into, like pages and pages and pages of that. But basically, you'll just have uh, party leaders. So in this case, in we, interestingly enough, we're talking about, you know, gubernatorial election in 2014 and people posturing Dan Rutherford, again, the state treasurer and the chair of the Romney campaign. Uh, he, the, the Daily Herald did a poll of, all right, out of these gubernatorial possible candidates, who do you, who do you want to win from the Illinois delegates? Rutherford won by a landslide, which is no surprise because as the chair of the Romney campaign, uh, it was all people that he would kind of handpicked. That's basically how it's done. You'll have the party leadership go for somebody either that they think could be a rising star or that they like or are friends with and think, hey, it'd be cool for you to be in Tampa or Charlotte, <laughs> or that has a good voter base and is maybe a local leader and therefore could bring along votes and support and will be good when... Now it's really time to, again, do door knocking. So that's basically how it's done. And when you vote in the primary, you vote for a delegate. But it's partially their name and partially the name of the in the presidential candidate for whom they are. And really, I think with that enthusiasm gap, though, that you're talking about, certainly at the Illinois level, where, where you see a lot of that is, is with the unions. I mean, the, the unions are, they, they are sitting on their hands right now. And, and they're very angry, obviously, over the pension debate, over the facility closures really like they feel like they've been treated pretty shabbily by the governor and you know what we saw at the convention were, were great efforts by Governor Quinn to sort of showcase that he does have union support I mean I think there were at least two occasions where he he kept bringing out the UAW uh, regional director and and Quinn has been successful in bringing auto jobs to Illinois auto manufacturing jobs in Belvedere and Chicago um, but but you know one of the things Michael Kerrigan said he's the president of the Illinois AFL-CIO if Quinn does not make peace with labor in 2014, he can't be reelected. That, I think, huge. Is, is very big. He is the one of the you know, top union officials in Illinois saying that. And I think that is an enthusiasm gap. And you know what? We in Illinois, I mean, fatigue, I, I do understand what you're saying, but we have it so lucky here because, <laughs> you know, the, the, the TV is not lit up every single second with these attack ads from the presidential campaigns because we're decided. We, you know, we're a blue state. But like, you know, what we saw in Florida, I mean, you turn the TV on there in the hotel room and it was like, you know, it was just like every single go around, you know, you'd see Bill Clinton on there talking about Obama or you'd see Romney, you know, giving his spiel and it just, it, it's steady. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that might be part of it, but I think more than anything right now, it's, I mean, because that, that hasn't a hundred, that hasn't really changed. You saw four years ago, leading up to the presidential election, tons of campaigns and everything then. But I think that whereas the economy was bad, it wasn't as bad and prolonged as it is now. And I think that people were excited on both sides. They were revved up for new candidates. And um, Obama, I mean, it was historic. Whether you liked him or not, it was historic and that he was the first African American <laughs> the president. I mean, people were more pumped about that. I think now it's when your life kind of stinks and you're worried about paying your bills, it's hard to get worked up about working for somebody else and having the belief that either party is really going to, you know, change that. Especially, I think a lot of what plays into it is what's happening in Washington D.C. and has happened in Illinois as well, with not a lot of change happening, not a lot of success, not a lot of, you know, happy times. <laughs> and so I think that's part of what makes people. Yeah, we're not, not the best pumped. people to ask mm -hmm. about this probably because the longer you cover politics, the less enthused <laughs> you are about anybody or anything with it. So we do have another question though. There didn't seem to be much news coverage of protesters outside the conventions this year. What protest groups were there and how effective were they in getting their voices heard? Well, I mean, the first day of the, I think it was the first day of the Republican gathering, there were a group of, of folks who came in and took over the podium from the Republican chairman, Pat Brady. And it was short-lived, and I, I don't, I, I mean, it They got were fighting little, for the minimum wage. Yeah, it got a little bit of attention, but I mean, it, 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 it didn't really move my needle too much. Yeah, um, I think there were some Ron Paul folks who, it, within the confines of the Republican Convention Center, were upset. I kind of stumbled upon that and watched and witnessed, and it was interesting, um, just because 
you know, party f- fraction, but that I don't think got um, all that much attention. There were some protesters. I would say more of a presence in Charlotte, and I think that could in part also be the community that Charlotte is uh, versus Tampa. It was uh, the downtown Tampa where the convention center was. Seemed kind of empty. There wasn't all that much there. Uh, Tampa's, you know, one city we were in Clearwater for Illinois, so a good 45 minutes away versus Charlotte was more of a central downtown. And so there were protesters there. Um, I think you didn't see them. There weren't a ton, though. And it's just kind of civil disobedience. Okay, go ahead, do your thing. I th- <laughs> I mean, where, where there was actually some protest that, that I thought was kind of remarkable, and, and if you took your eye off the TV screen for a minute, you missed it. But like, uh, it was on the final, next, maybe it was the next to last day of the Democratic Convention, they had a vote on the party platform. And if you remember, there was a, uh, uh, I think it was at the San Antonio mayor who was, was a, had the gavel, and he was you know, asking for a voice vote on adopting the platform, the Democratic Party platform. And he had to do it three times because there was so much opposition. And, and that, that opposition related to two things. For whatever reason, the party decided to take any reference to God out of the, the party platform, and that, that created a stir. And then there was also a, a, you know, an issue about uh, declaring Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And, and so those two things, um, the party had to go back and basically reinsert these things to appease parts of their base that were upset that, that they had been taken out. So I mean, that was, that was actually kind of a meaningful type of protest that, that led to something. But it was, it was so unusual because these, these conventions are so scripted, so choreographed, to have a guy saying, all right, by voice vote, let's approve these. And you see people in the crowd screaming and getting animated. And you know that's not the image that the, the people who do these conventions want people to see. I would also add, too, I think it's awful hard, especially if you're out there by yourself, for example, trying to cover this. The security level is so great at these events that it can be so hard to say, get outside where some of these things are happening and then get back in. It can literally be probably a three hour process to do the whole thing. And uh, that gets in the way. I also think though that the media tends to have a bit of an attention, a short attention span. And we've over the last year saw the rise of the Occupy movement that was covered very heavily. A lot of people think that has fizzled out to some extent. Not that some of those issues don't still remain, but I don't know maybe if the organization for planning these out and, and getting these things in a way that they're going to get covered sometimes, you know, uh, if, if that if that has something to do with it too. Right, and th- there was some of that in Charlotte, and I know there was a group of Illinois individuals that were coming down to protest Republicans, uh, different than the folks that for a minute went on stage at the Republican breakfast and grabbed the microphone, but also individuals who were there to advocate on behalf of the minimum wage and against what they said were, you know, Republican millionaires that were looking out for their own best interests. Uh, also, at the Republican convention, there was a woman from um, Code Pink, which is an organization that is dedicated to health care, and particularly health care for women. There was a brief hubbub about that. I think part of why the party, why you don't see as much protest is because the parties are really divided right now. So that's where you get the protest is the the Democrats are protesting the Republicans and the Republicans are protesting the Democrats more so than has been where the parties, people say, you know, what's the choice between the two? They're the same. That I don't think you can make that argument right now. And I think that's why you have enough of a, uh, enough opposition with the parties and enough material issues that getting chants and rants isn't as much the story as the actual policy in the heart of the debate. You know, we saw a little bit in, in Charlotte with, you know, there, there were expectations, a little bit of a buzz that AFSCME was going to come and storm a, uh, an event that Governor Quinn was having one evening. And, and it just fizzled, you know. I mean, they had a they had a billboard truck, you know, and and one or two of their members, and that was it, you know. So I mean, even even the unions had had trouble kind of, um, you know, bringing their members down there. But you can understand why. When again, when you're talking about a hotel room that costs three ninety nine a night, you know, a prison guard from Pinckneyville is not going to be able to afford that, and so that that kind of tamps it down. I think. And I'll add that Democrats, I think, in Illinois, the, the unions are really the big fight right now. Um, but that's with Pat Quinn. And we heard from uh, the AFL-CIO, President Michael Kerrigan, saying, our fight is with the governor. Our fight is not with Obama. So that's where I think also the Democrats 
where the unions didn't make as big a fuss as we had either heard rumored or they may have otherwise, and they did at the state fair where Pat Quinn was the central figure. They, unions, it's in their best interest, they will tell you, to have Obama win. So they're not going to try and mess up that party line with a national election they're going to, they'll do it here within the confines of our state because <laughs> then it's not as directed as Obama. They can direct it where they want it to, and that is to the governor. We're going to wrap things up here. I do want to give our uh, panel maybe one last chance to add anything that I didn't uh, mention, if you had anything, uh, anything you want to add to people about the upcoming elections. Hmm. Huh. Sounds like, sounds like we <laughs> covered it all there, didn't I? I do Everything. I will say one thing uh, real quick I think is a problem for the state of Illinois, too, and it's on the topic of elections, and that is, and Amanda always points this out to me, and this year is a great example of that, you think you have a choice when you go to the ballot box to vote, and in many cases, you really don't. I mean, and the state senate race here is a great example of that, and, this, and nothing against the people running for that who ran in the primary or are running now. But it's just an example of there is no Democratic candidate because that district is drawn so tightly to benefit a Republican, and you have it vice versa all over the state, that you don't have that choice when you walk in there. You really don't even have, a, you don't even have anybody maybe other than a blank name that you could write in, and that's not probably going to do much good. So that is a concern, I think, something that you may want to take with you as you uh, start thinking about politics and maybe push towards some type of change for that. But I uh, want to, again, appreciate uh, Dave McKinney of the Chicago Sun-Times, Amanda Vinicky of WUIS Radio. Thank you all. Thanks for coming out. And happy birthday.